a few minutes, we should have the introduction of some of the foreign dignitaries, as well as uh, the arrival of President Clinton, Mrs. Clinton, Vice President Gore, and Mrs. Gore. Uh, we'll have the presentation of the colors, the national anthem, and then at 11, about 11 minutes after 11, we'll have the beginning of the, of the actual ceremony, and that will be the invocation. I'm going to take a quick look behind us, and it looks like things are just a little bit behind schedule. We'll note that um, we won't actually hear from President Clinton or even Vice President Gore until much later in the program. Before that, we'll be hearing from the people who were involved in the construction, the design, the construction of the museum. First, we'll hear from uh, Harvey Meyerhoff, who is a, a uh, well-known uh, philanthropist from Maryland who has been presiding over the completion of the museum. He'll talk about basically what it was like to see this whole thing whole thing through to completion, which was a considerable amount of effort. We'll also hear from Elie Wiesel, who was the original founding chairman of the United States Holocaust Memorial Council. Uh, he, is a, he himself is a survivor of the Holocaust. I knew him as a professor at my alma mater, Boston University, but he's also known to many other people as the author of the book Night, uh, which details the horror of the, uh, the Holocaust. He'll be speaking. Uh, he was, again, the one who was sort of the beginning of this whole memorial. Uh, President Carter, in 1970, or excuse me, 1980, asked Elie Wiesel to be the guiding light behind all of this. So he sort of looked after the design. He was the visionary. He was the inspiration that got people together, started getting money together. And then in 1986, he handed it over to Bud Meyerhoff, who is now, who has seen it through to the end, and who was uh, more of the detail man who looked into the construction and so on. So we'll hear from both of those uh, people this morning. Uh, again, the master of ceremonies will be Ted Koppel, who is uh, the moderator of Nightline. He should be beginning to speak shortly. We will also hear, after, uh, after Mr. Meyerhoff and Mr. Wiesel, we'll hear from Chaim Hurst. We are joined here in our studios by Jamie Raskin, who is an expert on the Holocaust, uh, in fact, formerly a professor on this uh, most important time in our history at Harvard University. Mr. Raskin joins us in our newsroom. And Mr. Raskin, what, we, uh, what this memorial uh, memor commemorates is, I guess, one of the ugliest moments in human history. The question, though, is why is it important? Why is it necessary to do that? Well, the Holocaust has really become the central organizing event for the moral imagination of the 20th century. After the Holocaust, it's really changed everyone's understanding of society and government and politics. And so the museum stands as a memorial to man's inhumanity to man, and it's important to remember the specific events that took place uh, in Europe during the Holocaust, but also to remember for the future because it's a yardstick by which we can judge repressive regimes in the world today and in the future. It is interesting to note that the American Jewish Committee made a survey uh, not too long ago in which it was noted that about, I, guess, I think it was a third of the American populace uh, is not aware of the Holocaust. When asked what that word meant, they really didn't know. 
and perhaps even more surprising and alarming, um, a third of those surveyed uh, said it is entirely possible that it never happened. I would think that that would be even uh, another reason for, uh, th that would make it even more critical for people to be aware of, what's, of what happened then and, and for this memorial. Right, well, well, history is a very transient thing and memory is even more delicate than that. And after all, many of the survivors of the Holocaust have died and we're probably um, in the last uh, decade or two uh, in which we will have survivors with us to bear witness to the events that took place. So what's so special about this museum, which I visited, is that it brings together the historical records that historians have compiled since World War II with the specific individual memories of people who survived the camps and people who liberated the camps. And it's really a, a stunning and awesome experience to go in and to listen to the tapes of survivors speaking and to see photographs of the camps and also to look at photographs of European Jewish life before the Holocaust took place. There's some wonderful photos of families on picnics and at the beach and so forth. And it's just such a shocking thing to look at them and to know what their fate is, even though they didn't know. When we look at what's happening in the world today, Mr. Raskin, when we look particularly at uh, what's going on over in Croatia with uh, the Bosnia and, and Herzegovina, in, over in Herzegovina, with the situation there with the Serbs and the Croats and others, um, we have a very current and contemporary alarm, do we not, as it regards uh, what is possible, what, what is possible for humans to do to each other? Yes, we do. There are very bad tidings in Europe now, and I think that the American Jewish community is especially sensitive and acutely aware of the events that are taking place in Bosnia. And I think that this museum will help us to mobilize our memory and also our activism about coming to the aid of people who are in danger of massacre and repression all over the world. One way it seems that we're doing that, this museum is unique in that people are invited to get real personal, I mean, to, to actually get involved. Uh, they give you a passport, so to speak, uh, which identifies you with somebody who actually suffered through the Holocaust, and at the end of your tour, you find out um, what happened to that person. It, it, it is intentional, is it not, to get people personally and emotionally involved? Right. Well, the, the whole museum is set up um, to walk you through the events beginning in 1933, through the liberation of the camps, beginning with the anti-Jewish riots and the Nuremberg logs and laws and um, the accelerating repression of the Jewish community, and you're given a passport with someone... Uh, that, that belonged to someone who perished in the Holocaust uh, with your to age and your sex, guests. and then you walk through it, and it, it's, uh, Excellency it's a very painful Suarez, thing. President of the Portuguese Republic. Thank you, Mr. Raskin. We get the impression that the program is about to begin, or at least we thought so. I thought I heard a, an announcer down there, but apparently His not. His Excellency Franjo Tudjman, President of Croatia. His Excellency Jan Iliescu, President of Romania. His Excellency Dr. Jelou Jelev, President of the Republic of Bulgaria. His Excellency Arpad Gons, President of Hungary. His Excellency Lech Wałęsa, President of the Republic of Poland. Okay. This is Linda Vester reporting live in front of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. As they're introducing the dignitaries, we noticed something interesting just a few moments ago. They introduced the leader of Croatia, and there were boos here, uh, largely because of what is happening in that region right now. As we all know, there's an intense civil war going on, and some people here who are marking the man's inhumanity to man, and of course the, uh, the dedication among many here never to forget what that was like, are, are believing that this is happening all over again, and it's just happening in the former Yugoslavia, and then people are failing to do anything about it. So it was noteworthy that people happened to boo when the leader of Croatia was introduced. Uh, we believe that they're continuing, they'll be continuing to introduce uh, dignitaries for a few more minutes, and then uh, finally they'll introduce the arrival of uh, President Clinton and Mrs. Clinton,
and Vice President Gore and Mrs. Gore. Professor Raskin, are you still with us? Professor Raskin? Yes. It should be noted, uh, while this museum has been called stark and disturbing, it is also a monument to, to the heroes uh, of the Holocaust, to the people who, who resisted and to those who freed the concentration camps. And not all of this museum uh, is dark and disturbing. Some of it speaks to, to the heroes who emerged. And, and there were many, both Jewish and Gentile, who worked uh, against extraordinary odds to rescue people. and. The heroes of the Warsaw Uprising are also commemorated who took uh, a, a, just a tiny number of weapons, a lot of them just knives or revolvers, and went up against uh, the full military might of the Nazi war machine and were able to hold the Nazis off for several weeks and to inflict some casualties on the other side. And that is uh, a very proud moment in the history of resistance to fascism. The activities of the week ha have included a, a ceremony uh, uh, celebrating those liberators. And, and uh, maybe we shouldn't plug PBS here, but there was a wonderful PBS documentary recently, The Liberators, and a, a book that accompanied it. And uh, some of those folks took part in the ceremonies earlier this week and, and met again uh, some that, uh, that they had seen on those uh, dark, horrible days. We're looking at a live picture now of uh, Vice President Gore apparently waiting his entrance to the program. Vice President and Mrs. Gore. Professor Raskin, uh, there was an interesting article in the Post this morning that mentioned some of the other dark days of, of humans and some of the other atrocities Ladies that have taken gentlemen, place. The Vice President of the United States, Al Gore and Tipper Gore. And it should be noted uh, that uh, many killed during the Holocaust uh, were, were, there were more than Jews, there were gypsies, there were homosexuals, uh, there were... Uh, the handicapped, uh, anyone whom the Nazi regime did not deem uh, worthy to live. And His so Excellency this is Heim Herzog, President of Israel and to, Mrs. Herzog. Any single atrocity against people. No, and I think that the organizers of the museum have been very careful to include in the exhibits the fact that the Nazis targeted not only the Jews, but also Poles and homosexuals and handicapped persons and persons deemed insane and otherwise uh, socially unfit and uh, so I think that the museum's done a very good job of characterizing the whole fact of onslaught as targeting not just Jews but people deemed generally Ladies and inferior. gentlemen, the President of the United States and the First Lady and most depraved examples of human conduct, but also to the best, the bravest, and the most loving in the human soul. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the presentation of the colors and remain standing for the singing of our national anthem by the Alice Deal Junior High School this, Choir this of Washington, D.C., followed by the invocation. This part of the program should run uh, rather quickly because we are several minutes behind schedule. We'll have presentation of the colors, as they just mentioned, we'll have the national anthem, and then the invocation by Bishop Christopher Stondahl. He is a preeminent authority in Christian Jewish relations and comes to us from uh, Brandeis University. We'll hear from him first, and then we'll get more into the program. We'll, uh, well, then we'll go on uh, into the speeches by some of the dignitaries and, of course, by our own leaders. Back to the program.
Bishop Christoph Stendhal will deliver the invocation. O oh God, both hidden and revealed, be present with thy creative power of life. Be present in this place, this memorial of the obscenest of deaths and devastation. Be present as thy spirit, thy ruach, thy driving wind, thy breath of life hovered over the chaos and the void on the first day of the world. By thy presence, may this memorial work in each of us who come here that most specific resolve for what must be his next step, her next act. By thy most holy and creative presence, let the work we dedicate today not have been in vain. In thy presence, let there be much silence for each and every one who comes here. Silence to hear and to respond honestly, decisively. I, for one, as a Christian, pray that we in the churches be rudely and finally awakened to our age-old complicity in the ultimate crime of the Holocaust. Be present, O God, to us all, and bring us together in one resolve against all hatred. And let the words of thy prophet, his cry, his lament, be heard for generations on this mall of this nation. The words, is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? Behold and see, there is a sorrow like unto mine sorrow, which is done to me. So we say, never again, ever. Leolam lo od. Amen. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the Master of Ceremonies, Mr. Ted Koppel. Mr. President, His Excellency the President of the State of Israel, Mr. Vice President, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I am the son of refugees from the Holocaust, but I can never know what some of you here have experienced. There is a line between us that can never be crossed. I cannot remember events I never experienced, and you who experienced them can never forget. But here, at last, is a place where we can meet. Still separated by the line of experience, but a place where we can touch, where even the dead can reach out to the living and touch. This is a place where timeless questions are raised, 
where was God? And why did he permit the innocent to be trampled? Even the prophet Daniel, celebrated as the wisest man of his time, whose confidence in the Almighty commends him throughout the ages as a paragon of faith, even Daniel could be troubled in his own time by God's failure to intervene. Where, asked Daniel, are God's mighty acts, seeing that the heathens enslave his children? Where was God? The God of infinite mercy and compassion who was willing to spare the entire city of Sodom for the sake of even 10 virtuous men. Are we to believe that not even 10 virtuous men or women perished among the six million? Surely not. Then why? And again, why? Unless we are obliged finally to draw the distinction between God's capacity and God's will. And since, if we believe, we cannot question the Almighty's capacity, what can we at least begin to conclude about God's will? The message, God knows, has been conveyed to us often enough through saintly men and women of all faiths. We must accept responsibility for one another. The line is attributed to Edmund Burke, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. So that when we speak the words never again, they must be more than just a defiant warning to our enemies. Those words are also a pledge to all innocent victims of hatred and racism and bigotry, Jews or Christians, Muslims or Hindu, or those without faith be they here in Washington, or in Jerusalem, in Cambodia, or Bosnia. This place and what we commemorate here today demands that we pledge never to close our hearts to the oppressed. Never again. Never. Then, surely, God's will will be done. This museum is the result of the work and devotion of many people, none more committed and passionate than the current chairman of the United States Holocaust Memorial Council. It is my privilege to introduce to you Mr. Harvey M. Meyerhoff. Mr. President, his Excellency, the President of the State of Israel, Mr. Vice President, Excellencies, distinguished guests, survivors, ladies and gentlemen. Only guard yourself and guard your soul carefully, lest you forget the things your eyes saw and lest these things depart your heart, and you, sh and you shall make them known to your children and your children's children. These words from the book of Deuteronomy are engraved on the wall behind the flame, the eternal flame, in the Hall of Remembrance thousands of years old, they poignantly set out the mission of the unique institution we dedicate today, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. It is a mission of remembrance and education. Only guard yourself and guard your soul carefully, lest you forget the things you saw, and lest these things depart your heart. 200,000 Americans from all 50 states provided the funds to build this museum. Their generosity and the unstinting support of the federal government 
which donated the land for the museum, now enables this institution to begin its eternal journey of remembrance. This building tells the story of events that human eyes should never have seen once, but having been seen must never be forgotten. Our eyes will always see, our hearts will always feel, but it is not sufficient to remember the past. We must learn from it. The story of the Holocaust is not simply a story about the evil people did to people. The unspeakable acts perpetrated by the Nazis upon six million Jews and millions of other victims, Poles, Gypsies, Soviet prisoners of war, homosexuals, the handicapped and political and religious dissidents. It is also a story about hope decency, and what people did for people. The saintliness of the rescuers who risked their lives, and in some cases lost them, to help strangers avoid the inhumanity of the Nazi regime. Importantly, it is also about the things people did not do at all. The indifference of the bystanders who watched as their neighbors and friends were first denied their rights, then brutalized and ultimately annihilated. By compelling us to regard all those individuals, the victims, perpetrators, heroes, and bystanders, as individuals, this remarkable museum teaches us not merely about human events, but about human nature and thereby fulfills its mission of education. And you shall make them known to your children and to your children's children. By its very existence at the heart of our great democracy, this museum will teach generations to come, not only about the awful events of the past, but about the awful consequences of bigotry oppression, hatred, and, and intolerance, and about the responsibilities that each of us has as citizens of our democratic society. And in so doing, this museum calls forth the words from the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag and country, and summons us anew to the pursuit of liberty and justice for all. This is an American museum for the American people. It may prove to be more, but it must never be anything less. Many have worked so hard that this day might come. However, a handful of individuals were at the core of this effort. They share this dais today and deserve special thanks. Ben Mead for his dedication to the soul of this museum. Miles Lehrman for spearheading the enormous fundraising effort. Albert Abramson for his grace, energy, time and skill, without which this institution could not have been built. Sandy Brock, Sandra, for, her dedic for our dedication week activities. And to Bill Lowenberg, my vice chairman, confident and friend, I can only say 
I can only say that it would have been impossible to have reached this day without you. James Ingo Freed, an incredibly gifted architect. Designed this a building that allows us to comprehend the incomprehensible. Museum director Shaika Weinberg created a museum that tells an unforgettable story, unforgettably. And founding chairman Elie Wiesel, who first led us toward the realization of all our dreams. When I became chairman of the council six years ago, my late wife and my children told me this would be the most important thing I could ever do in my life. They were right. A private citizen, I have been granted a rare opportunity to help create the federal institution now before us. And as I stand today, with the President of the United States and among the survivors who are at the heart of Holocaust remembrance and in front of this institution that is already being described as a masterpiece of form and content. I am overwhelmed with a sense of fulfillment. I will be forever grateful to have had a role in its creation. And therefore, on behalf of the council and the museum staff, on behalf of the hundreds of thousands of Americans who have contributed so much, and on behalf of the Holocaust survivors and the millions whose last request was that their story be told. Zachor, we remember and we present this museum to the American people. We hope you find it worthy of its mission. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, the Honorable Thomas S. Foley. <clears throat> President and Mrs. Clinton, President and Mrs. Herzog, Vice President and Mrs. Gore, Your Excellencies, our distinguished guests, heads of state and government, Reverend Clergy, members of the Congress and the Cabinet, survivors, ladies and gentlemen. Today, as we dedicate this Holocaust Memorial Museum, we let the brightest light of America's national spirit shine on the darkest event of modern history. With the dedication of this memorial, we pass to generations of Americans a profound awareness of the moral imperative that unless we remain vigilant, what can begin is a seemingly small act of prejudice by word or gesture or a spray of paint on the wall can end in a memorial such as this one. To the thousands who have made this possible, to all those in public and private life who have created this memorial, the Congress wishes to offer its commitment, its determination, that what is represented here in memory will never again occur. It is my honor on behalf of the Congress to present to Mr. Meyerhoff as chairman of the council a copy of the resolution of the Congress, which was adopted by the House and the Senate. And in doing so, I will read only the last portion. Resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America, in Congress assembled that in remembrance of those who perished in the Holocaust, in tribute to the survivors who came to the United States to build a new life, and who with their families have, 
contributed so much to the fabric of our diverse society. In recognition of the heroic American soldiers who liberated prisoners of Nazi camps, in recognition of the anonymous bravery of rescuers from many lands who had the courage to care and place their own lives in peril to help others in need, and in the hope that Americans will learn from this museum the need to remain vigilant against bigotry and oppression, we welcome the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum to the center of our American heritage and state, now in recognition of the museum's motto that for the dead and for the living and for those yet to be born, we do bear witness. Mr. Meyerhoff, it is my honor to present to you now a copy of this resolution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Speaker, as you can imagine, we are proud to have this tangible evidence of the important role the United States Congress has played in the creation of this museum. It will have an honored and a permanent place in our archives. Thank you very much, sir. Before bricks and mortar came the vision. And here to share with us the realization of that vision, Nobel Prize laureate and founding chairman of the United States Holocaust Memorial C Council, my dear friend, Mr. Eli Wiesel. Mr. President, Mrs. Clinton, President Herzog, Mrs. Herzog, Mr. Vice President, Mrs. Gore, Excellencies, distinguished members of Congress, Mr. Speaker, fellow survivors, and friends. As one who was privileged to have been present at the inception of this noble and singular enterprise, may I say how deeply grateful I am to the American people, to its leadership in Congress, and the White House, and to its many benefactors, and to the survivors, especially the survivors, for helping us further the cause of remembrance. This impressive museum could not have been built without your understanding and generosity. For with the exception of Israel, our country is the only one who has seen fit to preserve the memory of the Holocaust and made it a national imperative to do so. Mr. President, you have brought change to this city and to this country. Some of the changes you have brought to Washington have been instant. One such notable change is that the average of the age has dropped by some 30 years. It is to that new young generation that you symbolize, Mr. President, that we now turn this awesome legacy so that you, Mr. President, can implement our vision. What has been my vision? When President Carter entrusted me with this project in 1978, I was asked about that vision, and I wrote then one sentence. And now, my words are here engraved in stone at the entrance to this edifice. And those words are, for the dead, and the living, we must bear witness. For not only are we responsible for the memories of the dead, we are also responsible 
for what we are doing with those memories. Now, a museum is a place, I believe, that should bring people together. A place that should not set people apart. People who come from different horizons, who belong to different spheres, who speak different languages, they should feel united in memory. And, if possible at all, with some measure of grace, we should, in a way, be capable of reconciling ourselves with the dead, to bring the living and the dead together in a spirit of reconciliation is part of that vision. Now may I tell you a story. Fifty years ago, somewhere in the Carpathian Mountains, a young Jewish woman read in a Hungarian newspaper a brief account about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Astonished, dismayed, she wondered aloud, why, she said, are our Jewish brothers doing that? Why are they fighting? Couldn't they wait quietly? The word was quietly until the end of the war. Treblinka, Ponar, Belgitz, Helmno, Birkenau, she had never heard of these places. One year later, together with her entire family, she was already in a cattle car traveling to the black hole in time, the black hole in history, named Auschwitz. But, Mr. President and distinguished guests, these names and others were known to officials in Washington and London and Moscow and Stockholm and Geneva and the Vatican. After all, by April 1943, nearly four million Jews from surrounding countries had already vanished, had already perished. The Pentagon knew, the State Department knew, the White House knew, most governments knew. Only the victims did not know. Thus, the painful, disturbing question. Why weren't Hungarian Jews in 1944? They were then the last remnant of Eastern European Jewry. Why were they not even warned of the impending doom? For one year later in 1944, three weeks before D-Day, that young woman and husband, all of them, were already turned into ashes. Jews from everywhere, old and young, beggars and industrialists, sages and madmen, military men, diplomats, professors, students, children, children, they were all entering the shadow of flames. An Italian philosopher, theologian, Giordano Bruno said, light is the shadow of God. No, it is not. It is fire that is the shadow of God. That fire that consumed a third of my people. Inside the kingdom of night, we who were there tried to understand, and we could not. We found ourselves in an unfamiliar world, a creation parallel to God, with its own hierarchy, with its own hangmen, its own laws and customs. There were only two categories, those who were there to kill and those who were there to be killed. In Poland, SS officers used Jewish infants for target practice. The only emotion they ever showed was anger 
when they miss. In Kiev, an SS officer beheaded two Jewish children in front of their mother, who in her anguish, in prey of some mystical madness, held them to, close to her bosom and began to dance. In Romania, the Iron Guard hanged Jews on meat hooks and displayed them in butcher shops with signs, kosher meat. So as you walk through this museum, so magnificently conceived and built by James Fleet, and illustrated in a way artistically by Ray Farr and her colleagues, as you walk through those exhibits, looking into the eyes of the killers and their victims, ask yourselves, how could murderers do what they did and go on living? Why was Berlin encouraged in its belief that it could decree with impunity the humiliation, persecution, extermination of an entire people? Why weren't the railways leading to Birkenau bombed by Allied bombers? As long as I live, I will not understand that. And why was there no public outcry of indignation and outrage? More questions. There were fighters in every ghetto, Jewish fighters. There were resistance members in every city, in every camp. Why weren't they helped? Help came to every resistance movement from every single occupied country. The only ones who never received any help, not even an encouragement, were the Jewish fighters in the Warsaw Ghetto, the Bialystok Ghetto, the Vilna Ghetto. And for me, a man who grew up in a religion, the Jewish religion, a man who his entire life thought that God is everywhere. How is it that man's silence was matched by God's? Oh, I don't believe there are answers. There are no answers, and this museum is not an answer. It is a question mark. If there is a response, it is a response in responsibility. In one of my tales, an SS officer says to a young yeshiva student, some you want to live, he said, some will laugh at you, others will try to redeem themselves through you, people will refuse to believe you, you will possess the truth, but it will be the truth of a madman. In 1942, a Jew called Yaakov Grabowski escaped from Chelmno. He came to the rabbi in Grabov, and in Yiddish he said to him, Rabbi, he said, Mahar the folk, they are killing our people. And when the rabbi looked at him, the Jew said, Rabbi, you think I'm crazy, I am not crazy. We are not crazy. We are not crazy because we still believe in human beings. We still believe and we still have faith. And President Herzog, you who came from Israel, and we are so grateful to you for coming, you know that you are part of that belief. It is because of the passion that we have for Israel, we as Jews and decent people in America that we have faith in humanity and in America. We also believe in the absolute necessity to communicate the tale. We know we cannot. We never will explain. My good friends, it is not because I cannot explain that you won't understand. It is because you won't understand that I cannot explain. How can one understand? that human beings could choose such inhumanity. How can one understand 
that in spite of everything, there was goodness in those times, in individuals. There were good people, even in occupied countries. And there was kindness and tenderness and love inside the camps, among the victims. What have we learned? We have learned, and in closing, Mr. President and distinguished guests, just one more remark. The woman in the Carpathian Mountains of whom I spoke to you, that woman disappeared. She was my mother. As the Nazis expanded their power with increased brutality, no nation offered refuge to Jews desperately trying to flee persecution. Without a homeland, they were destined for annihilation. After liberation, the survivors were displaced persons, still without home or nation. With the creation of Israel, they found both. Ladies and gentlemen, a World War II veteran of the fighting forces of the British Commonwealth, the President of the State of Israel, Chaim Herzog. <laughs> Mr. President and Mrs. Clinton, Mr. Vice President and Mrs. Gore, Your Excellencies, my distinguished colleagues, the heads of state, Your Excellencies, distinguished dais, ladies and gentlemen. This historic occasion taking place in the capital city of the leader of the free world is so pregnant with significance as to make it impossible in a short period of time to, uh, to encompass all that it represents. Fifty years ago, the Jewish people, for whom I, President of the Jewish State, serve as a spokesman here, were victims of a society and a philosophy which sank to the lowest depths of bestial cruelty. cruelty. Six million Jews, one-third of our people, were annihilated by the enormously efficient machine set up by the Nazis and their collaborators in many of the countries in Europe. The misery brought to the world by Nazism took a heavy toll in many countries in addition to the price paid by my people. In Jerusalem, but a few days ago, in the World Jewish Center of Remembrance for the Victims of the Holocaust, Yad Vashem, I addressed a nation, part of which had literally risen out of the ashes. I looked at the survivors of the Holocaust who had come to the haven of our people, which is Israel, who had embarked on a new life and had built a new society of which we are so proud. I saw their children and grandchildren for whom the Holocaust is but a memory, a nightmare which their parents and grandparents have recounted to them. This is a nightmare brought to life in our consciousness by the numbers tattooed on the arms of the survivors who are still with us. Again, but a few year, days ago, 
the people of Israel, the representatives of the Jewish people, and the people of Poland, led by President Lech Walesa, commemorated in Warsaw the 50th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. In that uprising, 700 scantily armed young men and women fought off thousands of well-equipped German troops in an incredible 27 days of heroic fighting. For them, resistance signified defiant courage and faith in the future of the Jewish people. The flame lit in Warsaw continues to burn in our memory, inspiring participation in the Israel War of Independence and subsequent struggles for life. For the legacy of heroism and dedication, our people will be forever grateful. While the national memory of our people must be enshrined in our homeland, in our capital city, Jerusalem, it is part of the memory of the Jewish people throughout the world. It is part of the conscience of all peoples in the free world. How appropriate are the words of the psalmist, Ki chilatsta nafshi mi mavet, et eni mi dima, et ragli mi dechi, et alech lifnei Hashem b'artzot hachayim. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. We are here today, Americans, Israelis, and the representatives of many other countries to commemorate an historic turning point of such extraordinary horror and evil that it dare not be forgotten, the Holocaust, that great lesson in man's capacity for inhumanity when moral restraints are cast aside. Despite random but despicable and disturbing attempts at denial, we know that there has never been anything like the gigantic industrialized death machine exterminating hundreds and thousands daily as a matter of course and aiming to eliminate the entire Jewish people and its culture. I speak here not only as the President of Israel just arrived from Jerusalem, but as one whose own life was touched marginally but deeply by the Holocaust. Many of my family, men, women, and children, were destroyed in the Nazi gas chambers. As a young officer from Israel serving in the British Army, one of a million and a half Jewish soldiers serving in the Allied forces, I was a member of the first Allied division to cross the German border in the West. As we advanced, we encountered the still hardly known horror of the concentration camps. Nobody who saw those terrifying scenes will ever forget them. I was later one of a small group to whom Heinrich Himmler, chief perpetrator of the vast ghastly murder, surrendered and was present at the surrender of the northern German army, Armee Gruppe Ems. When we reached Bergen-Belsen, we were shattered by the horrifying evidence of starvation, torture, and disease, and by the final epidemic of typhus raging there. To one who has seen anything of the Holocaust, even marginally, it ceases to be an abstract concept and becomes a searing actuality never to be forgotten. 
In this audience are many who survived the ghastly horrors of the concentration camps after having seen their near and dear ones annihilated, including some of the one and a half million innocent Jewish children who were exterminated. A few years ago, on the occasion of the first historic state visit uh, to the Federal Republic of Germany by the President of Israel, President von Weizsäcker escorted me to the same camp, Bergen-Belsen, and shared with me the agony of remembrance. Indeed, my state visits as President of Israel took me to a number of concentration camps in Germany, in Czechoslovakia, in Poland, and in Holland. In each of this, these camps, we dedicated a rock from the hills of Jerusalem, bearing in the words of the psalm, and my sorrow is forever before me. And I swore on behalf of my people never to forget, never to forgive. For us in Israel, which was to become the refuge of hundreds of thousands of survivors, the claims of rehabilitation and new life were paramount. We lament the many who might have been with us, and we sorrow for the vitality and talents lost, not only to us, but to humanity as a whole. Sadly recalling that there were those who knew and didn't act, we are determined to maintain a strong, viable, and independent country based on the memories of the past, the hopes for the future, the dignity of man, and the equality of all before God, a tower of strength, a haven when needed. The United States of America led the free world to victory in the struggle against evil against the Nazi regime and its allies in so many countries in Europe. It led the free world in demolishing and eradicating the wicked Nazi and fascist regime. It has always been in the forefront of the struggle against wickedness and tyranny, as it was indeed but two years ago in Operation Desert Storm. Its major role in bringing this museum into being is a natural corollary of its defense of freedom. The governments of the United States, laid, led by the presidents past and present, have in keeping with the great traditions of this country and mindful of the lessons to be learned for humanity, generously con contributed to the establishment of this center. It is true the United States, in this too, the United States has adopted its natural role of leadership for which all free people in the world must be forever grateful. In this connection, I wish to pay tribute to the Holocaust Memorial Council headed by Mr. Harvey Meyerhoff for its enterprise and successful achievement, which is evident before our eyes today. Nazism, fascism, and racism have taught us and revealed to us the depth to which the human being can descend. For us, one of the major lessons has been that it is not sufficient to have justice on your side, it is essential to be strong enough to defend it. We learned that there is only one answer to dictatorship and tyranny, and that is to stand up and fight and meet the challenges head on. For my people and for the State of Israel, the memory of the victims of the Holocaust is not only treasured as a memory, but as a moral imperative which binds us. But how are new generations removed in time to learn the lessons of the Holocaust so that mankind learns its lesson 
and we are all convinced that such tragedies can never be duplicated. How much a museum can do, we have learnt in Israel from the role played by the main central and universal Holocaust Memorial Institution, Yad Vashem, in Jerusalem. The details recalled by the fraction that survived, the historic evidence painstakingly gathered, are all stones in the structure of commemoration. May this new museum, situated in the capital of the free world, and exposing the unspeakable evil and suffering of the Holocaust, strengthen the commitment to life, to tolerance, and human kinship among all those who vi visit it, indeed, among the generations to come. Ladies and gentlemen, the award-winning Alice Steele Junior High School Chorus, directed by Lois Nicholson, singing Flying Free.
At a time when barbarism reigned across Europe, simply assisting a Jew risked terrible punishment. Basic human kindness, a, a shared meal, an open door, suddenly became an act of enormous courage. In 1942, Stefania Podgorska was a 16-year-old Catholic girl. She and her six-year-old sister were left alone in Szymyszel, Poland, after their father died, and their mother and brothers were forcibly taken by the Germans to a labor camp. While Stefania and her sister were themselves struggling to survive, they were approached by a friend, Josef Burzminski, seeking refuge. Together they devised a hiding place in two storage compartments in her apartment where she ultimately hid 13 Jews. Even after the Gestapo commandeered part of her apartment, forcing her to share her small living space with two German nurses, Stefania, who had witnessed the hanging of a Polish family for harboring Jews, persisted in her daring mission of rescue. The Talmud tells us, whoever saves a single life saves an entire world. Stefania saved the lives of all 13, including Josef, who would become her husband. Here today to join us in commemoration are Stefania and Josef Borzminski. I saved 13 people. People uh, kept today asking me why I did this. Hiding a saving 13 people, men, women, and children. Our parents told us when we were little not to make difference between people. We all have one God. It doesn't matter how well educated we are or how much money we have. They all ask, if you can help people, don't hesitate. When I saw the SS and Gestapo taking Jewish people into the ghetto behind the barber wire. In my heart and in my mind, I felt that what they were doing to these people was terrible wrong and inhuman. It was then that I decided to help the victim of this terror. When one evening there came to me one son of the owner of small grocery store where I had been working before the Germans came and he asked me for only one night of shelter. I couldn't refuse. He's, he told me that he had jumped from the window of a running train which was taking him and his family to a concentration camp. My decision was made at that time moment to help him and others. I believe that in life you have to show people good example. Who will teach people humanity if they see only killing and nothing else? Thank God 
after over two years of constant terror, we were finally liberated. We all survived, and one of the 13, Joseph, later married me. He didn't want to leave me after war. <laughs> so, so 13 people survived, and we survived, and thanks God, everything was all right. Thank you. A, a Polish little girl, a teenage, she and her little sister, Helena, six and a half years old, they saved my life and the life of other people. After liberation, we married. We have two wonderful children, a daughter, Christina, and a son, Edward. The rest of the survivors, they're now grandparents, and everybody is okay. Thank you. <laughs> 48 years ago, on April 14, 1945, the world listened as journalist Edward R. Murrow described the horror of the German concentration camp known as Buchenwald. The passage of time has not lessened the need for us to hear his words. Ted Koppel will now read for us Edward R. Murrow's broadcast from Buchenwald. Permit me to tell you what you would have seen and heard had you been with me on Thursday. It will not be pleasant listening. If you are at lunch or if you have no appetite to hear what Germans have done, now is a good time to switch off the radio. For I propose to tell you of Buchenwald. It is on a small hill about four miles outside of Weimar and it was one of the largest concentration camps in Germany. And it was built to last. And now let me tell you this in first person. I was the least important person there, as you shall hear. There surged around me an evil-smelling horde. Men and boys reached out to touch me. They were in rags and the remnants of uniforms. Death had already marked many of them, but they were smiling with their eyes. As I walked down to the end of the barracks, there was applause from the men too weak to get out of bed. It sounded like the hand clapping of babies. They were so weak. As we walked out into the courtyard, a man fell dead. Two others, they must have been over 60, were crawling toward the latrine. I saw it, but will not describe it. In another part of the camp, they showed me the children, hundreds of them. Some were only six. One rolled up his sleeve, showed me his number. It was tattooed on his arm. D6030 it was. The others showed me their numbers. They will carry them till they die. The children clung to my hands and stared. We crossed the courtyard. Men kept coming up to speak to me and to touch me. Professors from Poland, doctors from Vienna, men from all Europe, men from the countries that made America. We proceeded to the small courtyard. There were two rows of bodies stacked up like cordwood. They were thin and very white. Some of the bodies were terribly bruised, though there seemed to be little flesh to bruise. Some had been shot through the head, but they bled but little. All except two were naked. I tried to count them as best I could and arrived at the conclusion that all that was mortal of more than 500 men and boys lay there in two neat piles. There was a German trailer which must have contained another 50, but it wasn't possible to count them. It appeared that most of the men and boys had died of starvation. They had not been executed, but the manner of death seemed unimportant. Murder 
had been done at Buchenwald. God alone knows how many men and boys have died there during the last 12 years. Thursday, I was told that there were more than 20,000 in the camp. There had been as many as 60,000. Where are they now? I pray you to believe what I have said about Buchenwald. I have reported what I saw and heard, but only part of it. For most of it, I have no words. If I've offended you by this rather mild account of Buchenwald, I'm not in the least sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, William J. Lowenberg, survivor of Westerbork, Auschwitz, and Dachau, and vice chairman of the United States Holocaust Memorial Council. Forty years, eight years ago this month, my world changed. After an endless nightmare, I awoke one morning a survivor. Today, as every day since the tragedy ended, I remember. Forty-eight years ago, I was a prisoner at Dachau, standing behind the barbed wire fence, staring at amazement the American tanks raced over the hills towards us, bringing liberation and freedom. Today, I'm standing on the hallowed ground of the capital of the free world, a world away from that April so long ago. Yet again, I feel the same sense of amazement the sight I see before me, this magnificent memorial museum, is a prayer answered, a dream come through. On behalf of all the survivors gathered here, and for those millions who did not survive the inferno, I want to thank the American government for providing the cherished land on which this museum has been built. I want to thank the thousands upon thousands of people whose contributions of all kinds made this museum possible. I also want to thank one person especially whose dedication and tenacity created this museum, our chairman, Bud Meyerhoff. In the distance stands the Lincoln Memorial. As a young man before the Civil War, Mr. Lincoln worried what he called, quote, the silent artillery of time, unquote, would inevitably take all who had lived through and all who had fought in the American Revolution and therefore and thereby rob our nation of the living memory of the struggle for freedom. Memories are fragile in this world and we the survivors and liberators, the witnesses and the rescuers are entering our twilight years. We too have worried that the silent artillery of time would rob the world of those who remember and of history that must never be forgotten. Today, this worry ends. For as long as our nation's capital endures, this building ensures that so too will the memories and truth. As both a survivor of the Holocaust and a veteran of the Korean War, I want to pay special tribute today 
to the American Armed Forces. who liberated the concentration camps. I do not recall many details from that fateful day, nearly half a century ago, when our freedom was restored. I was thin, weak, dazed, and sick. I do recall that the Nazi soldiers continued to bomb the camp killing the innocent until the last possible moment. I especially recall our American liberators who bought us food and the equally important sustenance of kind and tender words and a helping hand, unknown to the tortuous years before. One of those soldiers was Robert Jacklin, I do not know if I knew Bob Jacklin in Dachau or met in Dachau a half century ago, but I know him, I know him. Deep in our hearts and every day, we will always remember the brave and compassionate soldiers of the United States Army who liberated us and the American soldiers who gave their lives for us and helped us to live again. There are no words to express our gratitude, no gift we can give you nearly as precious as the gift you gave us. You and all those who liberated the concentration camps, not only to save our lives, you made it possible for us to create new lives. Bob, I'm going to hand you in a few minutes a photograph of my family, my wife, my children, my grandchildren, my most precious possessions. Surely these new lives are the ultimate answer to the madness of the world we left behind. From the bottom of our hearts and our souls, and forevermore, we thank you. Bill, from the bottom of my heart, I accept this in honor of all of these divisions that liberated all the concentration camps of, of Germany, and we love you dearly. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Koppel, President and Mrs. Clinton, His Excellency, the President of Israel and Mrs. Herzog, to the distinguished heads of state gathered here in the audience, Mr. Speaker, to the many members of the House and Senate who are gathered here, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, fellow human beings. This memorial museum will help us explore a question that is as urgent today as it has been for the last 50 years. How could the human race have allowed such a calamity as the Holocaust to fall upon us. 
What terrible darkness lies coiled in the human soul that might account for this barbarism? The sorrow rising from such questions is deeper than all tragedy and leaves us mute before a mystery the human mind cannot penetrate. We are reduced to a silence filled with the infinite pool of feeling that has created all the words for humility, heartbreak, helplessness, and hope in all the languages of the world. The story told in this memorial museum warns us of the unfathomable power of evil and the pestilence of the human soul that for a time can dissolve nations and devastate civilization. But it also tells us of the inspiring resistance in the Warsaw Ghetto and in hundreds of other locations not as well known. It tells us that a fierce bright light blazes eternal in the human breast and that the darkness can never put it out. It tells us of the rescuers. It tells us of nations, two in particular, Denmark, where the story is well known, and Bulgaria, where the story is less well known. Nations where an entire people rose up and said, this shall not happen in our midst. It tells us of the necessity of leadership dedicated to preventing intolerance, hatred, and oppression. President Bill Clinton has devoted his life and his public career to those principles. He learned them growing up in Arkansas. As a governor, Bill Clinton stood up to racism and bigotry and intolerance, working hard to bring the people of his state together in common purpose. As president, he continues as a tireless advocate for the rights of the defenseless, the rights of individuals, for human rights in a struggle waged every day around the world. His message is clear. The United States stands for freedom and opportunity, for equal rights and democracy. It is an honor for me to serve with him and an honor to introduce to you the President of the United States, Bill Clinton. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President, and Mrs. Gore, President and Mrs. Herzog, distinguished leaders of nations from around the world who have come here to be with us today the leaders of our Congress and the citizens of America, and especially to Mr. Meyerhoff and all of those who work so hard to make this day possible, and even more to those who have spoken already on this program, whose lives and words bear eloquent witness to why we have come here today. It is my purpose on behalf of the United States to commemorate this magnificent museum, meeting as we do among memorials within the site of the memorial to Thomas Jefferson, the author of our freedom, near where Abraham Lincoln is seated, who gave his life so that our nation might extend its mandate of freedom to all who live within our borders. We gather near the place where the legendary and recently departed Marian Anderson sang songs of freedom and where Martin Luther King summoned us all to dream and work together. Here on the town square of our national life, on this 50th anniversary of the Warsaw Uprising, at Eisenhower Plaza on Raoul Wallenberg Place, we dedicate the United States Holocaust Museum and so bind one of the darkest lessons in history to the hopeful soul of America. As we have seen already today, this museum is not for the dead alone, 
nor even for the survivors who have been so beautifully represented. It is perhaps most of all for those of us who were not there at all to learn the lessons, to deepen our memories and our humanity, and to transmit these lessons from generation to generation. The Holocaust, to be sure, transformed the entire 20th century, sweeping aside the Enlightenment hope that evil somehow could be permanently vanished from the face of the earth, demonstrating there is no war to end all war, that the struggle against the basest tendencies of our nature must continue forever and ever. The Holocaust began when the most civilized country of its day unleashed unprecedented acts of cruelty and hatred abetted by perversions of science, philosophy, and law. A culture which produced Goethe, Schiller, and Beethoven, then brought forth Hitler and Himmler, the merciless hordes who themselves were educated as others who were educated stood by and did nothing. Millions died for who they were, how they worshiped, what they believed, and who they loved. But one people, the Jews, were immutably marked for total destruction. They who were among their nation's most patriotic citizens, whose extension served no military purpose nor offered any political gain, they who threatened no one were slaughtered by an efficient, unrelenting bureaucracy dedicated solely to a radical evil with a curiously antiseptic title, The Final Solution. The Holocaust reminds us forever that knowledge divorced from values can only serve to deepen the human nightmare, that a head without a heart is not humanity. For those of us here today representing the nations of the West, we must live forever with this knowledge, even as our fragmentary awareness of crimes grew into indisputable facts, far too little was done. Before the war even started, doors to liberty were shut, and even after the United States and the Allies attacked Germany, rail lines to the camps within miles of military significant targets were left undisturbed. Still, there were, as has been noted, many deeds of singular courage and resistance. The Danes and the Bulgarians, men like Emmanuel Ringelblum, who died after preserving in metal milk cans the history of the Warsaw Ghetto. Janusz Korczak, who stayed with children until their last breaths at Treblinka. And Raoul Wallenberg, who perhaps rescued as many as 100,000 Hungarian Jews. And those known and those never to be known who manned the thin line of righteousness, who risked and lost their lives to save others, accruing no advantage to themselves, but nobly serving the larger cause of humanity. As the war ended, these rescuers were joined by our military forces who alongside the Allied armies played the decisive role in bringing the Holocaust to an end. Overcoming the shock of discovery, they walked survivors from those dark, dark places into the sweet sunlight of redemption. Soldiers and survivors being forever joined in history and humanity. This place is their place too. For them as for us, to memorialize the past and steel ourselves for the challenges of tomorrow. We must all now frankly admit that there will come a time in the not too distant future when the Holocaust will pass from living reality and shared experience to memory and to history. To preserve this shared history of anguish, to keep it vivid and real, so that evil can be combated and contained, we are here to consecrate this memorial and contemplate its meaning for us. For more than any other event, the Holocaust gave rise to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 
the charter of our common humanity and it contributed indeed made certain the long overdue creation of the nation of Israel. Now with the demise of communism and the rise of democracy out of the ashes of former communist states, with the end of the Cold War, we must not only rejoice in so much that is good in the world, but recognize that not all in this new world is good. We learn again and again that the world is yet to run its course of animosity and violence. Ethnic cleansing in the former Yugoslavia is but the most brutal and blatant and ever-present manifestation of what we see also with the oppression of the Kurds in Iraq, the abusive treatment of the Baha'i in Iran, the endless race-based violence in South Africa, and in many other places we are reminded again and again how fragile are the safeguards of civilization. So do the depraved and insensate bands now loose in the modern world. Look at the liars and the propagandists among us, the skinheads in the Liberty Lobby here at home, the Afrikaners resistance movement in South Africa, the radical party of Serbia, the Russian black shirts. With them, we must all compete for the interpretation and the preservation of history, of what we know and how we should behave. The evil represented in this museum is incontestable. But as we are its witness, so must we remain its adversary in the world in which we live. So we must stop the fabricators of history and the bullies as well. Left unchallenged, they would still prey upon the powerless, and we must not permit that to happen again. To build bulwarks against this kind of evil, we know there is but one path to take. It is the direction opposite that which produced the Holocaust. It is that which recognizes that among all our differences, we still cannot ever separate ourselves one from another. We must find in our diversity our common humanity. We must reaffirm that common humanity even in the darkest and deepest of our own disagreements. Sure, there is new hope in this world. The emergence of new vibrant democratic states, many of whose leaders are here today, offers a shield against the inhumanity we remember. And it is particularly appropriate that this museum is here in this magnificent city, an enduring tribute to democracy. It is a constant reminder of our duty to build and nurture the institutions of public tranquility and humanity. It occurs to me that some may be reluctant to come inside these doors because the photographs and remembrance of the past impart more pain than they can bear. I understand that. I walked through the museum on Monday night and spent more than two hours. But I think that our obligations to history and posterity alike should beckon us all inside these doors. It is a journey that I hope every American who comes to Washington will take, a journey I hope all the visitors to this city from abroad will make. I believe that this museum will touch the life of everyone who enters and have education against ignorance, of humility against arrogance, an investment in a secure future against whatever insanity lurks ahead. If this museum can mobilize morality, then those who have perished will thereby gain a measure of immortality. I know this is a difficult day for those we call survivors. Those of us born after the war cannot yet fully comprehend their sorrow or pain. But if our expressions are inadequate to this moment, at least may I share these words inscribed in the Book of Wisdom. The souls of the righteous are in the hands of God. 
and no torment shall touch them. In the eyes of fools, they seem to die. Their passing away was thought to be an affliction, and their going forth from us utter destruction. But they are in peace. On this day of triumphant reunion and celebration, I hope those who have survived have found their peace. Our task, with God's blessing upon our souls and the memories of the fallen in our hearts and minds, is to the ceaseless struggle to preserve human rights and dignity. We are now strengthened and will be forever strengthened by remembrance. I pray that we shall prevail. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the lighting of the eternal flame by President Clinton, Mr. Meyerhoff, and Mr. Visso. Okay. As President Linda Vester reporting live now in front of the uh, ceremony to dedicate the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Linda Vester reporting live now in front of the uh, ceremony to dedicate the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. As we stand here, President Clinton is preparing to light the eternal flame for the museum. He's joined by Bud Meyerhoff, who is the present chairman of the United States Holocaust Memorial Council. Beside him also is Ailey Wiesel, who was the founding chairman of the council. We should note that the flame will not be kept here outside, exposed to the elements, but will be kept inside, inside the museum's Hall of Remembrance, which Please join us in a moment of silence dedicated to those who perished in the Holocaust. This eternal flame will burn forever in memory of the past and with hope for the future. Please remain standing for the benediction by Rabbi Alfred Gottschalk. God of all peoples, Tzur Yisrael v'goalo, Rock of Israel and its Redeemer, we stand before you as Moses did before the burning bush. You called him, and he answered, Hineni, here I am. God said to him, Shalna lecha mi'al raglecha. Moses, take off your shoes. For you are standing on holy ground. It is with this sense of the sacred that we stand before you. Our hearts are filled with awe, laden with pain, and also with gratitude. Our pain consumes our very being, for we remember our fathers and our mothers our sisters and our brothers, our families and our friends, whose memory is sacred to us, cruelly torn from our bosoms in days and nights of starkest terror. Our gratitude flows from the knowledge that we and our children gathered here today are brands plucked 
from the burning, survivors of the Shoah, who are commanded to speak the unspeakable. This place sacred to memory, this museum in America stands as an eternal witness to the Holocaust. It also stands for resistance to evil and the enshrinement of that which is good in the human spirit. We thank God this day for those noble and courageous spirits who dared to remember and who banded together to build this museum. Those presidents of the United States, the Congresses of the United States, members of the United States Holocaust Memorial Council, its august leadership and staff, and the thousands, nay, tens of thousands of contributors who have generously supported this venture. All are remembered today, appreciated, and thanked. This museum must become a living memorial to the victims of the Holocaust so that all might come to learn its message and future generations be spared new grief and new pain. Yes, as Leivik wrote, the heaviest wheel rolls across our foreheads to bury itself deep somewhere in our memories. Let then this memorial built in our nation's capital speak to all our citizens, to all the human family, as a warning of what can happen when evil is not aborted at its beginning and when wickedness is permitted to flourish without hindrance. Let us be ever vigilant not to forget the past. Let the past instruct us now and in the future to secure the dignity of the human family everywhere. And now as we are standing in grateful appreciation to our Creator, let us recite the Shehechianu together. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shehechianu V'kiyamanu V'higianu Razman Hazeh we thank you, O oh God, creator of the universe, that you have enabled us to reach this time, this place. And let us together say, Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, the renowned American soprano, Jesse Norman, will now sing America the Beautiful.
And so the program has ended. The dedication of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum with some special moments, the passionate, personal, deeply removing, deeply moving comments of Ellie Bissell, the founding chairman of the Memorial Council. Also the remarkably brief, wonderfully light remarks of a woman who sheltered, a Jew who was persecuted, and the man who later married her. And also the sobering eloquence of Edward R. Murrow in his broadcast from Buchenwald almost 50 years ago now. And Jim, perhaps we should close with the words of a survivor of the uh, Warsaw Ghetto Uprising who said recently to a member of the Ger German parliament, fight tirelessly against every form of human hatred and never say we can do nothing against injustice and violence. Thank you for watching.